الحمد لله رب العالمين حمد يوافي نعمه ويدافع نقمه ويكافئ مزيده فاللهم اخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم واكرمنا بنور الفهم وافتح علينا بمعرفة العلم وسهل اخلاقنا بالحلم واجعلنا مما يستمعون القول فيتبعون احسنه اللهم اجعل اعمالنا خالصه لوجهك ولا تجعل فيها حظا لغيرك يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك امين فاللهم لا تحرمنا خير ما عندك بشد ما عندنا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين فالسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين نعم So we're still discuss, discussing uh, Islamic contract law. And uh, what we have taken thus far in terms of discussion is that we broke down what the original book entailed. And we said that from this book, we will be discussing the chapter or the book of sales. When it came to the book of sales, we sketched for ourselves a picture of what a sale is. And then we identified certain, certain uh, integrals or certain arcan, right? And these arcan, when they are found in the correct condition, then the sale will be valid. And we said that these arcan or these integrals are three. We spoke about the contracting parties referring to the buyer and the seller. And we said that the contracting parties have to meet certain conditions. And in the last lesson, we discussed those conditions. We said that the contracting parties must have unrestricted contractual capacity. We also said that there must be the absence of coercion without just cause. We also said that when the commodity is a Qur'an, then the buyer thereof must be Muslim. And we also said that when the, contracted, uh, when, when the contracting party is at war with, uh, or part of a state who is at war with Muslims, then uh, it will not be permissible to sell them sell them weapons, right? So they must not belong to such a state if it is that you want to sell them weapons. We also mentioned that of the arcan or the integrals are, is the contracted item. And we said that the contracted item consists of the commodity and the counter value. Then lastly, we mentioned that there is also the formula, which consists of the offer and the acceptance, right? Or the offer to purchase and the offer to so, right? So we have discussed the contracted item, um, or not the contracted item, we discussed the contracting parties, right? And the last discussion that we had taken regarding the contracting parties is we said that when it comes to the contracting parties, meaning the buyer and the seller, then either of the contracting parties can decide to enact the sale themselves or they can appoint someone else to enact the sale for them, right? When they appoint someone else to enact the sale for them, this can either be in the form of <coughs> this can either be in the form of a slave, or which you won't find a, a contemporary example for, or it can be in the form of a proxy, right? A representative, an agent. Then we said on top of that, when a person decides to appoint a proxy or an agent to enter into a sale on their behalf, whether that be for the purpose of buying or for the purpose of selling, we will stipulate for that proxy the same conditions that we stipulate for the original contracting party. What do we mean thereby? We mean thereby that if it is that a person wants to buy something, and we stipulate that the person must have unrestricted con contractual capacity. We stipulate that there must be no coercion. And we stipulate the other two conditions regarding the Quran and weapons. Then if I want to appoint someone on my behalf to do that, they have to meet those same conditions. So an adult cannot appoint, according to the Shafi'i school, an adult cannot appoint a minor to enter into a contract on their behalf. Right? And just as the adult cannot appoint a minor to enter into a contract on their behalf, the contract of sale, so too is the adult barred from appointing the minor to 
do most things that have to do with the administering of wealth, right? We said that there's a limited sphere in which we will allow the miner to administer, right, and to interact with the wealth of the of the of the duty bound adult. For example, to accept a gift, right? For example, to allow somebody entry into a home. For example, the delivery of a gift. These are just some examples. These are just some examples. So. Since we have stipulated this, we asked ourselves the next question. What about, and we're now on page number 25, what about the case of the contract uh, of the buyer or the seller, meaning the contracting party being inanimate? Being inanimate. So we asked ourselves the question. Uh, let's say we have the case that we're going to deal with here that the author brings to us is that of a vending machine. Say we have a vending machine, right? How do we view the vending machine in terms of these conditions? Right? Say you go to KC and you have to pay for your parking ticket. So over there you've got a vending machine. Isn't it so? Is that a vending machine? Close enough? Right? Let's, okay, let's maybe say that's not a good example of a vending machine, but I think people really use vending machines in these days. It was something that was more common. Uh, in the past, but it's a similar type of configuration, right? So now you put your two rand or your five rand in there, and it gives you the the ticket. Or in a conventional vending machine, you put your ten rands in there, and you get your uh, chocolate that's not on the boycott list, right? So what's the chocolate that's not on the boycott list? Nestle. Hey, don't give wrong stuff here. Yeah. Beacon, beacon, that's a safe one, right? What, what kind of chocolates do beacon have? TV bar, TV, yeah, TV bar, that's nice. There's two colors, right? The one is red, what's the other color? The blue, which one is better? The blue one, okay. So now you're going to the vending machine, you put in your 10 rands, probably be 20 rands in this day, right? You put in your two, but Baraka is, uh, uh, where is like the, uh, uh, is the, is from that here? Right? So you put in the 10 rand, your Malena 10 rand, or the Baraka, isn't it so? And now you are going to select the blue TV bar, and the machine is going to give it to you if the money doesn't get stuck. <laughs> right? What do we make of this? Do we now ask ourselves the question, hey, is this thing a minor? When was it born? Right? Is this thing sane or is it insane? What to do? You understand? Thereafter, we can take the same discussion and then we can bring it to be upon al-manasat, right? And al-manasat refers to the, the purchasing sites, the purchasing sites, all right? Whether that be in the form of an application or the form of an online site. So let's read what Malana has to say to us over here. The contracting party may either enact the sale himself or have someone transact on his behalf. According to what has preceded, when the owner intends the latter, right? What's the latter? Someone else acting on his behalf. His slave or an agent stands in his place. The slave or proxy then administers the wealth of his master or commissioner as per his permission, right? So an important point here is as per his permission. What does this mean? This means that when someone is appointed as a proxy or as an agent, then they are only allowed to administer that wealth within the boundaries set by the owner. So if the owner, if the owner says, look, buy this thing, right? I appoint you to buy this thing, then you must buy it, right? So the owner could either intend thereby that you must procure the item, meaning what? You must secure it by any which halal means. Or they might stipulate your procurement of the item specifically on account of qualities that you have. You understand that? So when it is that the original owner appoints you to procure the items on account of qualities that you have, right? Then it will not be permissible for you to appoint a third party in order to enact that. You understand? What's an example? For example, 
um, a person might tell you, they might commission you to make a garment. They might commission you to, to make a garment. So, and this is a very common one. So a person commissions you to make a garment. For example, I want to make a shirt. So I go to Auntie Rushta in Lotus River, right? Not paid advertising. And then she takes my measurements and whatever. And because I know that she made Sheikh Ismail Lance jacket, that's also true, I wanted to make the same jacket for me. You understand? So now, why am I commissioning her? I am commissioning her on account of the expertise that she has. Will it then be permissible for her to take uh, that mandate and commission someone else? No. Why? Because I have appointed her for this because of the expertise that is with her. The same thing when it comes to buying. You might have a trader that is a skillful trader. So when you appoint him right, to sell some of your goods, you do it on account of him being savvy. Right? Therefore, it will not be permissible for him to appoint a third party to undertake that. Because it won't have the same effect. As for the case where you don't intend to specify the agent, rather you just require that a certain item must be procured or a job must be done, then it will be permissible for them to involve a third party in order to get that done. And this is common in building. Right? When somebody hires you to build, they don't expect you to lay the bricks. Isn't it so? They expect you to, in the least, manage the project. So over here, you have a case where it's not required for a specific person to do it, but rather, he has to get the workers together to complete the job. You understand that? So that masala is understood? Taib. So we move from this and he says, as for our current circumstances, then the owner has another option at his disposal. Behold. Behold, uh, it is a vending machine, which is a mechanical device that just charges small items such as food or drinks after inserting, mo inserting money into it. So, what is the Islamic ruling in choosing this method of transaction? I say, and success is from Allah, if it is permitted for the owner to appoint an agent or allow his slave to administer his wealth, then, a fortiori, it will be permitted for him to configure a machine through which he transacts, as long as the other conditions of sale are met. The soundness of this a fortiori argument is manifested in the following ways. Right? So now he's going to explain. What's a fortiori argument? In Arabic, for those of you who can uh, get benefit from this, the term they would use is bil awla. So we'll say that um, if Muhammad has the capacity to lift 10 kgs, what are you benching now? You don't bench. Do you even bench, bro? <laughs> <laughs> right, who benches here? Jasmine, what, what, what do you bench now? That's like a rude question. <laughs> 40, right? So if Shadli has the capacity to bench 40, then a four theory, he has the capacity to bench 20. If, it's, if the carrying of 40 kgs is possible for him, then it is more possible for him to carry 20 kgs. So this is the type of argument that Malala is employing here. What is he saying? He's saying that if the Sharia is going to permit somebody to appoint a human agent in the form of a slave or a proxy, then a fortiori, more appropriately so, the Sharia, by extension, should permit the owner of wealth to configure a device for transactions. You got that? So that's the argument, right? How does he prove this? Firstly, the probability of error in the machine in carrying out the transaction of the owner is less than what is present in humans. Right? Whether it be an agent or slave, that is because man's nature is to forget and err, apart from the self-interest and desires which may overcome him. Right? What does Malana mean by this? That when you configure a machine, the machine nine out of ten times will be more precise than a human. And also, the machine won't think, you know what, 
Let me keep this two rand for me. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> Unless you have a Cape Thurian machine. <laughs> right? But the machine, the machine doesn't, the machine doesn't have the same capacity for error as humans when it comes to conventional transactions. Just as the machine doesn't have the capacity to cheat you. Right? Or did you see somebody? I've never seen a person, you know, the other day, a few weeks ago, maybe about at least five weeks ago, um, I, was in the, I was in the mall, and then uh, I had to get my parking ticket, you know, and then the machine wasn't working, so I put my, put my money in, the machine took my money. And not for a moment did I think to myself that this is a Scalima machine. That this is a, a Scalima machine. Because the machine doesn't have that human capacity. You understand that? So if there's a glitch, technical support, you get it back. You understand? So this is the first argument, that the probability of the error in machine is, is less. Here's page number 26. Ah, 26. Number two, the transaction of the owner via an agent or his slave, right, when he appoints somebody, is undoubtedly considered an indirect transaction, right? The vending machine, oppositely, more closely represents the direct transaction of the owner. That is because the owner constructs a vending machine to sell what the owner wants to sell, but potentially. When the price that the owner wants is inserted into the machine by the buyer, the sale actually takes place. So, the owner, in relation to the agent, an instructed slave is a commissioner, and in relation to the vending machine, is a programmer. And Allah knows this. Right? So what's he saying in the second point? In the second point, he's saying that if the Sharia is allowing you to appoint someone to interact on your behalf indirectly, where they will interpret what you want, the Sharia, a fortiori, in a more applicable way, should allow you to program something that will be more precise to do that for you. Make sense? I see I put confusion in your eyes. You understand? It's understood? Everyone answer? So, so this is how it works. There's a further discussion, but because we didn't yet take the discussion of formula, I won't like burden your mind with it. But if you, not after class today, I have to go sleep after this. So, but when we get there, you can ask this question that where's the offer and the acceptance? Right? How does that work? But we, you can keep it in your mind. When we get to the, the formula, we can ask that question. To end of this discussion, I say, if it is correct to legally configure the function of the vending machine as representing the direct action of the owner, then neither intellect nor maturity is stipulated for the vending machine. Rather, the presence of these two qualities is stipulated for the owner who placed this artificial intelligence within the machine. Does that make sense? So what is Malna saying over here in this last point? That if the machine represents the direct will, and here we're not speaking about divine will, human will. If the machine represents the direct will of the owner, then we don't need to stipulate intellect and maturity for the machine. We must stipulate it for the owner who places that within the machine. So once we find that in the owner, then we can find it in the, then we, then, then, then we suffice with it being present in the machine. Make sense? So you can apply this to um, checker 60, like to take a lot, apply to all of these places. Right? There's a little bit more um, nuance to the take a lot and all of that, but in principle, it's the same idea. Delivery services, sort of a separate thing, but you still pay for it through the same thing. Um, they commission someone else to do the, the delivery, and you can, that third party contract is also valid. So you're covered in relation to all of those things. Is there a question during the class? Bismillah. Well, assuming that uh, the person, the owner of the machine, assuming this person is uh, 
commonly accepted. For example, the machine has the intelligence to tell, okay, let's use uh, gender. The males, you have to pay more than the females. And it's like a census. Set. So that would that be uh, a means of like the machine who represents the owner as like not being, doing the right thing. Uh, because the machine is only doing what it's, what, what it's told to do. Hmm. So, yeah, I don't know if it makes sense. Like, okay. So uh, let me see if I can summarize the question. The question says that um, that let's say the machine was more advanced than the vending machine, and it had the capacity to discern between different types of potential buyers. And let us set up as an example for this, males and females. And the machine is configured to charge females more than males? Males more than females? The, it's a Muslim machine. So the machine is configured to charge males um, more than females, right? Then would we, would would that uh, you know disparage uh, the machine? You understand that? Would we find issue with that? So, since we consider the machine to be a direct. Um, since we consider the machine to be a direct representative of the owner, then we ask ourselves a question. Were the owner to be standing before you? And let's say the owner wanted to sell this book, Al-Ibhaj wa Ta'nis. Right? They wanted to sell this book, which you actually buy this book just because it has like two, three extra sentences than another book. But this, sometimes the sentence can be valuable. Nonetheless, the person wanted to buy this. He wants to sell this book. So here's um, Fatima and here's Zaid. So now I say, Zaid, you want to buy this book? 300 rands. Fatima, you want to buy this book? 200 rands. Would, I, would the Sharia allow me to do that? Yes. So would the Sharia allow me to configure a machine to do that? Yes. Is that considered to be immoral? No. Not immoral. Because it's my money. And I can stipulate whatever product I want to stipulate on a product. There's nothing immoral about it. Right? If it is that you're doing that in order to discriminate against women and all of that, and that's got nothing to do with the sale. It's got nothing to do with the sale. You understand that? Time. So, that's the last of this masala, right? So we carry on from this. Now we move to the contracted item. We move to the, to the contracted item. So, just to bring us back a little bit, where are we now? What we had said before is that um, we have a sale. What we want to achieve out of the sale legally is we want to transfer wealth. In order to do that, the sale must have certain integrals and these integrals must meet conditions. We discussed the contracting parties and their conditions. There were three. Actually, we mentioned two, and then we mentioned two that refer to some of them, right? Then we said that just as the contracting parties can interact on their own behalf, they can have a proxy. We explored that proxy being a non-human, and we established the permissibility there. Oh, that's where we are now, right? Now we move to the contracted item. And the contracted item uh, refers to what? Who remembers? What? It is There's two words. A contracted item is two things. What are they? The commodity and the counter value. The commodity and the counter value. And the commodity, right, is what is being paid for. And the counter value is what is being paid with. So the contracted item constitutes the commodity and its counter value on page number 27. I say, and success is from Allah. Some people think that as long as the contracted item be it the commodity or its counter value, is not swine or wine, then it is permissible to sell. Right? Restricting the conditions for the validity of sale to purity of the contracted item in this manner is incorrect. Rather, there are other conditions besides it which are of equal or even greater importance. It is your duty, O seeker of success and felicity, to comprehend these conditions in its entirety 
and practice upon them so that you are not counted amongst those who believe in some of the book and reject some of it. And the meaning of perfect faith is not safe acting on all that is contained in the Quran and Sunnah. What follows is an explanation of these conditions. So the first condition, right, that we will stipulate for the two contracting parties is what? For the two con the, the, the contracted item in the form of the commodity and the counter value is what? Is purity. Is purity, right? So they must have a sheikh and the sheikh must do the task here. No. <laughs> What's purity? Purity means that the contracted item must be pure. And the understanding of purity here is the self same understanding of purity that the person will get when they are discussing um, wudu, when they are discussing uh, istinja, when they are discussing what breaks the salah. So what we consider to be impure there, we're going to consider to be impure here. So this is the purity that we're speaking, that we're speaking of, right? The corporeal, okay, so let me sketch this mas'ala for you, because otherwise I'm going to read a lot. When you have something, right, then that thing will have two parts. That thing that you want to sell will have two parts. The one we call the ain. The ain is the shell, right? The, 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 the physical uh, entity, you call it the corporeal, right? Then that corporeal will have a, a usufruct, a benefit, a utility for which you buy it. You understand that? So um, let's give an example. An example of this is... A dog. Example of this is a dog. So you have a dog, the dog has a body, right? But oftentimes, if you're going to acquire a dog as a Muslim, right, then you're not going to acquire it for the body. You're going to acquire it because the dog has a utility that will either be protection or it will be uh, for hunting. Or it will be a, a, like a shepherd dog. What do you call that? A sheep dog. Right? Not like a sheep dog. Like. <laughs> right? Or um, it will be for companionship, which is not a legal utility. So we leave that. A guide dog, yes, for blind people. Right? Type. So when we speak about the corporeal, we say that the corporeal must be pure, meaning the doggy, the, the doggy of the body, right? The body of the dog must be pure. The body of the dog must be pure, right? If the body of the dog is not pure, then the shafi'is won't permit itself. And when we say that it must be pure, we mean that the essence of it must be pure, right? So the dog's essence is impure. There's no state in which the dog can exist, we will consider it to be pure. As opposed to perhaps the scarf that I'm wearing. This scarf can be sullied with blood, right? It can be sullied with blood, such that we consider the scarf to be impure. We call it mutanajis, right? But this scarf can be purified. So because it can be purified, we say that the ain. The corporeal, the entity of the scarf is not pure. It, I mean, it's not impure. It's sullied with impurity. So because it's sullied with impurity, I can sell it. Do you understand it? So that's important to understand. That's important to, to understand. So when the ayn of the thing is impure, for example, wine, swine, and um, um, wine, Swine, dogs, whatever is born from these two type of animals, right? Um, and for example, feces uh, will be will be impure. The person cannot buy it. The person cannot sell it. Do you understand that? That's according to the Shafi'i school. It's according to the Shafi'i school. 
Yes, carrion. Carrion as well. Carrion. Not dead meat. Carrion. Because you can slaughter something in a halal way, that's pure. When you slaughter something in a halal way, that's pure. That's not najis. Right? You can make salah with that meat in your pocket under certain conditions. Right? You can make salah with that meat in your pocket under certain conditions if you know how to wash meat. Right? Which is not really good to wash meat. But anyways, um, we got sidetracked now. You sidetracked me. <laughs> right? So carrion. Carrion is when you don't slaughter something in a correct manner. That would be considered squandered and you cannot sell it. Right? You can tan the hide of that and when it becomes purified, you can sell that. You understand that? So when you, when you dye something, you tan it, you take the skin, you can still purify that. That's a separate masala, you can sell that. You understand? Yes. Hmm. So you go and tell me your common question. Don't worry, you're not the first to ask me this question. And you're not the first person that I told you can't sell it. <laughs> right? So according to the Shafi'i school, you can't sell manure. You can't sell manure. Toyif! What kind of class is this? Are you here to tell us what we can't do? Or are you here to tell us how to do what we must do? Ah. So over here, we visit the Hanafi school. When it comes to the Hanafi school, then we find that they permit the selling of the dog. We find that they permit the selling of the dog. So, notwithstanding the fact that the dog is impure, they permit the selling of the dog. Why is this? This is because there's a there's a ikhtilaf fil jiha. There's a difference of opinion in terms of the perspective from which they are viewing the contracted item. So, let's consider this to be impurity, and let's consider this to be utility. Right? Let's consider this to be impurity and let's consider this to be utility. So, when the Shafi'is look at the Mas'ala, they first look here. Once they see that this is impure, they don't look here. You understand that? So, this is the first tier. The first tier is, is there purity? If there's purity, then we look if there's utility. And if there's utility, then we look if that utility is legal. You understand that? So, for example, you find the thing is impure, the Shafi'i say, you can't sell it, right? You find the thing is pure, the Shafi'i say, does it have a utility? You say no, they say you can't sell it. They say the thing is pure, it has a utility. Does the Sharia recognize it like that of a... Uh, so for example, you have a guitar, it's pure, it has a utility. The Sharia doesn't recognize it, you can't sell it. That's the Shafi'i way. You understand that? But the, the, the Hanafi way is not that. They say, look, there's impurity. They say, oh, don't be so quick to judge. <laughs> Just because it's impure doesn't mean that it can't work. So he says, okay, what expertise you got? He says, no, man, he's a good security guy. Says okay, you can buy him, right? You can buy him, but if the Sharia doesn't recognize that utility, then the Hanafis will also say no, doesn't work, right? So the Hanafis don't accept every utility; they accept a utility, they accept the utility that the Sharia recognizes. What is the Hanafi thinking on this masala? The Hanafi thinking on this masala goes as follows: they look at the dog. And they survey its existence in the Sharia. Ah. So yes, the Prophet ﷺ makes certain pronouncements regarding its state of purity. Notwithstanding the fact that the Prophet ﷺ says certain things about its impurity, we still see a legal usage of the dog within the Sharia. Ah. Whether it be as a shepherd dog, as we mentioned over there, hyphenated, right? Or whether it be as a hunting dog. We speak about the kalb mu'allam, the dog that is trained in order to hunt. So we find that it has a utility which is recognized in the Sharia. So the, Shaf, so the Hanafis say that the Sharia cannot recognize a utility and block the road to acquiring that utility. Therefore, this necessitates that the Sharia must allow that it can be sold, sold 
even though it's impure. You got that? Whereas when you look at the pig, we don't say the same thing. Why? Because the pig has no recognized utility. So they're not going to go the same way where the pig is concerned. You understand that? Tayyib. So this is the, this is the mas'ala by the ahnaf. So according to the Hanafis, if the Sharia recognizes the utility of something, then the Sharia, then according to them, the Sharia should open a door for its acquisition, right? And this will be in the form of sale. This will be in the form of sale. So now you can get your guard down, right? Still, if you survey the textual evidences on this mas'ala, then you will find, you will find clear pronouncements of the Prophet وسلم, saying, because I'm a Shafi'i. You'll find clear, the Prophet didn't say it because I'm a Shafi'i. The Prophet وسلم, said it, and I'm telling it to you because to, to give you an understanding of where the Shafi'i Madhab is coming from. Where the Shafi'i Madhab is coming from is that there are ahadith which speak about the impermissibility of the, of the money of the dog. So the Prophet, not the money, the sperm, the money meaning that which you purchase it with, right? So the Prophet وسلم, speaks negatively about that money, that that money is not pure money. So if the money is not pure, then the sale is not valid. If the money is not pure, then the sale is not valid. And there are numerous ahadith which indicate to this. At the same time, we say there are other ahadith which indicate the, the, the kalb mu'allam, the trained dog, as being an exception to this. These are hadith are weak. These are hadith are weak. Right? So maybe next year we study hadith and then you can understand what weak is. But these, uh, these are hadith are, these are hadith are weak. So that's the mas'ala. Still, you can see, you can appreciate the fact that the Hanafis have a legal leg to stand on. You can appreciate the fact that the, that the Shafi'is have a legal leg to stand on. You can position yourself in terms of the, of the Shafi'i school. But where there's a need, for example, you got a security company, you need to acquire some dogs, Hanafi Madhab has got you back in that regard, right? So let's read a little bit about uh, how Malna says this. You may ask an honorable student, how then does one access a dog and benefit from its utility whilst the door to its sale is closed? I say, and success is from Allah, that there are other ways for you to acquire a dog. According to the terminology of the Shafi'i school, uh, since one cannot own filth but merely acquire it. One way is by gratis or gratis, handing over by endowments, animal shelters that take care of them. Right? So in the Shafi'i Madhab, there's a, there's a form of sub-ownership. The sub-ownership is called istihqaq, right to usage. So if you see a dog on the street and you feed the dog, then you have right to usage. You have right to usage. Then there's a very strange mas'ala in the Shafi'i Madhab that I haven't yet appreciated from a legal perspective. It's a mas'ala called raf'ul yad. And raf'ul yad means that when you have a right of usage over something that cannot be owned, then somebody else cannot come and take that dog from your yard. Why? Because you're feeding it and you got to it first. So they can't take it out of your usage until you relinquish it. What if they want to access it? You can relinquish your hand from it for a price. So we say, Taib Shafi'is, what's the difference? Isn't that a sale? So they call it Raf'ul Yad. Raf'ul Yad. The lifting of the hand. So, Rafa'atu Yadi Anhu Bikada. I lift my hand off this item which I have right of usage over for a particular price. Taib Shafi'is, isn't this a sale? Right? So, that's the madhab. <laughs> that's the madhab, right? I have nothing more to say about that. So, naam. The second precondition. So the first precondition is purity. We mentioned to you that what we mean by purity is that the Sharia must consider the entity to be pure. If the entity is pure, but it is sullied with filth, with impurity, the Sharia will still allow us to buy it and sell it. For example, the scarf that has blood on it. Right? Whereas if the entity in and of itself is impure, the likes of the dog and the pig, right? Then the Sharia will not allow us to buy it nor to sell it. 
That makes sense? No. Does a class a scarf have to be cleaned before it's sold? No. No. According to according to both the Shafi'i school and the Hanafi school, you can't sell a guitar, you can't buy a guitar. They say, Taib, you can use the wood, this, that. They say, that's what they say in the books. It's, it's Arabic words, but that's how you translate it. They say, <laughs> okay, so if you put a, a bucky, right, and on the bucky there was a dog, right, you would have to wash the bucky seven times once it's said. <laughs> right? Okay. So, what kind of bucky is it? What will you do if your mommy put food in the bucky and the bucky drive away? <laughs> Okay, so so yes, if you buy if you buy a bucky and the bucky has a dog, the dog is yours, right? The dog is yours. Yeah, the dog is yours, right? It's like taban as a as a follow on, but the bucky in and the dog in and of itself, no, right? But if they give you the the dog with Bismillah, take the dog. Yes. You can have a dog for security, yes, but I would not, uh, for the Shafi'i school, I would say don't keep the dog in the house. But outside the house, yes. Yes, for security, yes, you can. Mm. 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 The dog food is an interesting one. I'll think about it. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I've never thought about dog food before. So give it some thought, inshallah. I won't say anything about it, but give it some thought. Type. So, what time is this class in? 10 past. I wanted to do the second precondition. Okay, the second precondition is simple. The second precondition is that it must have a utility is that it must have a, a utility. And like we said, when we look at the utility, then we say that, that, that the utility will have two measures. They will have what? Two measures. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the utility will have two measures. What are these measures? So, the first measure will be a tangible measure, right? What do we mean thereby? We mean that when we consider a utility, meaning a usage, a user then we first look if physically this thing has a benefit. When that thing has a physical benefit, we then ask ourselves, does the Sharia allow us to access this benefit? For example, you have, let's take a, once again the example of the guitar, right? So you have the guitar, the guitar has a clear benefit, right? For example, the Sharia will allow you to buy a parrot. And they say, why? It's the Inas, because it's a good friend. That's a justification. The parrot is a good friend, isn't it so? Mal Abdullah had a parrot. Anyways. So when you look at the guitar, it has a clear benefit, music. But then we say, does the Sharia allow us that benefit? No. Therefore, we cannot buy it. We cannot sell it. You understand that? So it must have a tangible measure, right? So one of the other things about the tangible measure is that there are certain commodities which they have a tangible measure, but there is a quantity threshold. Whatever do we mean by quantity threshold? We mean that... Rice. If you have a cup of rice, you can access the benefit of rice. But you take that one, you take one grain of rice, you cannot access the benefit of rice. So rice has a threshold, right? 
when, it, when that threshold is met, the minimum amount is met, then that rice becomes beneficial. So in these cases where something cannot, the benefit of something cannot be accessed, except after it has met a threshold, then you are only allowed to buy it and sell it from that threshold. Therefore, the Shafi'is will not allow you to buy one grain of rice. You understand? The Shafi'is will not allow you to buy a speck of flour. They will consider that sale to be invalid. It's a squandering of wealth. You understand that? That's why if you go and you buy, sometimes you get um, certain things that you weigh. Right? Let's say you go to spa. Are we going to spa still? Is boycott spa now? No. Yes? No? Okay. So let's say we go to spa, right? Now we go to spa and we go there to the veggie section. Then a person wants to buy, you, 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 you get hold of one small chili and you press the chili thing and you put it on the scale. What does the scale say? Zero. Doesn't give a price. Because it's not quantifiable until it reaches a certain threshold. So can you see this idea? At the same time, will the shop allow you to take that chili for free since it has no value? No. So can you see the Shafi'i concept coming through over here? We, the, the benefit of it can only be accessed at the threshold, therefore we will only allow its sale and purchase at the threshold. You understand? So that's one. So... You stopped me in my tracks there. Bismillah. <laughs> it was just a comment just wanted to tell you how I felt about it. You know, well, some, so when we speak about utility, we don't mean that you need to physically use it. We mean that it must have a benefit that can be quantified. So an ornament has a benefit that can be quantified. You decorate your house with it. And the Sharia considers that. So you can buy something, but you don't, like, we're not using the chandelier. We're not using the chandelier, right? But the chandelier has a clear benefit with us. You understand that? We're not using, for example, what do we have here? We're not using this wood behind us here, but it has a clear benefit. And the benefit is Zina. Not Zina. Zina. Right? Beauty. And the Sharia recognizes that as a quantifiable benefit. You understand that? So you can think about you can think about that in relation to collectors, items. Right? Um, let me end the class and then we open for questions. So what did we what did we learn today? We learned today that um, we continued our conversation about the proxy. We stipulated for the proxy or the agent the same things that we stipulated for the original contracting parties. And then we established via that and through an a fortiori uh, legal argument that we can, in fact, configure machines in order, to, in order to interact or to administer wealth on behalf of owners. Thereafter, we moved to the contracted item and we said that the contracted item will have to meet certain conditions in order for it to validly enter into a sale and be exchanged as wealth. The first thereof was purity. When we spoke about purity, we said that purity means that the essence must be pure, that the Sharia considers this to be a pure thing. Then we said that something can be sullied with impurity, though the essence is pure. In that case, we will allow its sale due to it being purifiable. The second thing that we said regarding that is that the Hanafis, they will not make that a single port of call, but rather they will see if the item has a legal benefit. If it does, they will still allow its sale. Then we said that the second condition is that the item must have a benefit. We said that that benefit must first of all be tangible. And if the tangibility of that benefit is connected to a quantity, in that the benefit can only be accessed in a certain threshold, then it must meet that threshold in order for us to exchange it as a form of wealth. Once we have established that physical benefit, we have to ask ourselves, does the Sharia allow us to access this benefit? If it does, we can exchange it. If not, then not. Tomorrow we continue with the third and the fourth condition, and then the fifth condition, 
and the conclusion of the fourth condition, and then that will take us into forward buying. Um, so we might get into drop shipping and those type of things too tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, we end with that uh, in terms of the class. Uh, questions? Yeah, so I'm going to read this out. Uh, 